Hence, does uh, Richmond hire throughout the season in the restoration sites. And the restoration site never had abundances that were lower than the reference site. The trend in relative ground beetle abundance from mid-June to August also followed a similar pattern, as you can see, it dips and um, has peaks all in the same areas. And there was also a large decline starting from the beginning of the season all the way down to um, August. All three restoration sites had also had a large increase in relative below abundance here between July 21st and July 28th. The key value for the difference between restored and reference sites was 0 0.105. The graph showed that the reference sites did have a higher of ground beetle abundance per site section. The difference in the relative ground beetle abundance was significantly different between each site. The p-value for that was 0 0.039. Now for my second research question, are beetle assemblages different between restored and reference sites? For this, I used a box plot to compare the means of beetle species, or the total means by species. This graphic is of what species were collected along across all the dates. The total ground beetle, it shows the total ground beetle abundance for the entire season. P. californicus and S. ventricosus both had the same means of the total abundances between their stored and reference sites. The abundances of P. californicus were especially low at this site, and both species did not respond to whatever, whatever differences there were in the restored and reference sites. A. fenibris and C. cumulus did have different means of the beetle species between restored and reference sites. You can see that because the mean here is greater in the restored and than the reference sites for both species. A. Funibris and C. cumulus were more abundant in most cases in the restored sites, and the means of the two species were higher in the restored site. The previous slide showed all of the sites combined together. If I look at the same data by site, I get a more detailed overview of the total beetles collected for one site. At Bear Creek, the total ground beetle abundance throughout the season showed a lot of beetles in restored sites for all four species. All four beetles had high abundances at the restored site. S. ventricosis at this particular site was also the most common species. Both sites at Brenza Forty Creek and the San Lorenzo River had the same species compositions and site type comparisons. A. fenibris and C. cumulus had higher abundances in the restored sites than the reference sites. P. californicus and S. ventricosis both were greater in the reference sites here there than the restored sites. The total number of plants per site section in all three sites was greater in the restored than the reference sites. And the total plant cover of all plant species was greater in the restored compared to the reference sites. And my last research question, how do beetles respond to plant cover and or abundance. For this particular question, I used a stepwise binary logistic regression. And I determined that the step at step three was the best fit for my model since the percentage, the percentage correct was um, fewer than 10% difference between um, with 81.1% and 71.4%. This here shows all of the different um, variables that were added into the stepwise binary logistic regression, starting with um, P for beetle species, plant abundance, the number of species, and plant cover. And you can see at step two, plant 
abundance was taken out in plant. That's step three. Um, plant abundance and S. ventricosis were removed. For this test, I used the total abundance of all the four species, plant cover and individual plants as variables. Mal used all six of those variables to ter determine which characteristics define a, s a difference between restored and reference sites. I determined that step three was the best model. And this step included all six variables except for S. ventricosis and plant abundance. The model at step three was significant at P is less than 0.001. The model at step three explained nearly 50% of the variance at 46.7%. The model correctly predicted 81.1% of the reference site characteristics and 71.4% of the restored characteristics and had a combined percent correct of 76.4% overall. As ventricosis and plant abundance were not included in the model at step three, C. cumatillus, Teristicus californicus, were, and A. fenibris were all included in the model. And their p values were 0 0.007 for C. cumatillus, 0 0.070 for Teristicus californicus, and 0 0.120 for Encominus californicus. Plant cover was also um, included in the model, and its p-value was 0 0.029. Now for my discussion and management recommendations. I did determine that there was a high high beetle abundance at the restored sites. I also found that there are greater abundances of A. fenibris and C. cumatillus totals and plant cover in the restored and the reference sites. I determined that Teristicus californicus, A. fenibris, and C. cumatillus and plant cover were all characteristics that could be used to determine the difference between a restored and reference site. Invertebrate abundance was, I determined, not lower at the um, restoration sites, and if anything, showed the trends there show um, higher um, total abundances in the restored sites. I also found that plant cover could have corresponded with at least two beetle species, A. funibris and Clinaeus cumatillus. The finding that ground beetle abundance was higher in restored than reference sites was consistent with findings by Catron et al. in 2003 who evaluated restored river habitat in New Mexico where carabid abundance was greater in managed areas. High carabid abundance in restored compared to reference sites indicates that the restoration efforts conducted by the Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz County had succeeded in creating habitat with quantifiable matches to an undamaged site. Similarly, Mickles Jr. et al. in 2010 found that ground beetle abundances returned to that comparable in a reference site soon after Restoration was completed, and the restoration at their site in Texas was um, removing invasive plant species. I also found that structural aspects of river habitats, such as herbaceous plant cover, are shown to contribute greatly to carabid beetle species distributions. C. cumatillus seemed to respond to 
increases in plant cover because it is an omnivorous species that eats many types of plant species, along with a wide array of insects. Anti Vogel and Bond in 2001 found that herbaceous plant cover was one of the most important variables explaining ground beetle species and environmental interactions. The results also show that one ground beetle species may be directly associated with plant cover and structure, as I found with strong associations between C. cumatillus totals and per percent plant cover. Because crabbed beetle abundance seemed to be improved and plant cover was shown to be different and restored and compared to reference sites, I would recommend to restoration managers with the Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz County to continue planting herbaceous native plants in an effort to restore riparian habitat. Herbaceous plant cover seemed to influence population changes population increases in three different <coughs> carabid beetle species, C. cumatillus, A. finibris, and P. californicus. The natural recruitment of plants and restored river habitat on the Branza Forty Creek, Deer Creek, and the San Lorenzo River continued years after restoration efforts were implemented in 20 2010, 2009, and 2011, respectively. A multiple year study would be necessary to explain main drivers of crabbed beetle species and population dynamics as they relate to plant habitat and structure in the San Lorenzo River watershed. It is clear, however, that restoration, manage, restoration and the management efforts put into place by the Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz County influence, influence sustained beneficial changes to terrestrial invertebrate and plant communities. You can also say that C. cumatillus can be used as a bioindicator bio or a sampling technique for mm -hmm. any future mitigation projects that they may do. Here's my literature cited. And with that, I'll answer any questions you may have. Conservation District and asked them if they had any restoration sites that I could possibly use and they gave me kind of a pamphlet of all the restoration that they had done in the past few years and I selected ones that were in the kind of habitat that I was, lo that I was looking to do along rivers or creeks and they um, let me use them and contact the landowners. Um, great talk, thank you so much. Um, I, in looking at the maps, uh, I had a thought. So you have one site where the restored and the reference are half a mile apart. Yes. And you have two sites where they are, you said, right next to each other. How close are they to each other? They were directly adjacent. So I did 40 meters of the restored site uh -huh. and skipped. 10 meters, and okay. then went straight into an area that was comparable. Um, I can't recall right now just how the sites broke down in terms of in terms of differences. But did you look at potentially? So I don't know how far these beetles can walk. Right. Right. So is it possible that the restored sites that basically? If, if the sites were further apart, you'd get a stronger signal because is it possible that the restored sites are acting as sort of a refugia and a source for beetles to spread further out? I, Do you know how far they walk? There's a lot of, um, a lot of debate about it since, like for other studies I looked at, kind of have the, the different plots set different bases apart, so I, choose, I chose 10 meters, even though other um, 
studies have chosen like five or 20 because mm -hmm. they think that that's far enough for them to be separate samples mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So it's, um, I'm not exactly sure, but no, there is a little bit. Of but there's literature support that basically you wouldn't get kind of cross crossing of beetles that mostly hang out in one into the other. Yes. Gotcha. Thank you. Dr. Russell. Um, a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, just uh, I was hoping, wondering if you could help me understand the difference between the restored sites and the reference sites. Uh, the restored sites were sites that had non-native species removed. Right. Were the um, the reference sites also disturbed? Did they have the non-native species, or were they were they relatively healthy sites? How did you de determine which which sites to use for reference sites? The reference sites did not have invasive plants at all. So they were the the reference sites were sort of the best case scenario. Right. Exactly. I see. Okay. So we were hoping that the the restored sites eventually would end up being more like the reference. Yes. Okay. And then um, one last question. I wonder uh, if if you looked at native versus non-native plant species in relation, you looked at cover, but do you look at species diversity for native and non-native plants as well to see if they were related to the beetle abundance or diversity? I didn't really look at diversity. It seemed like that at least the, the different plants at both sites were just about the same like representation of plants at, between the reference and um, restored sites since they were pretty much directly um, next to each other or in similar areas. But I didn't exactly do any tests or... Um, so you had the same suite of species essentially on, yes. on both. Were there any sites available that were unrestored that had a lot of the non-natives that you maybe could have compared to to see what the worst case scenario was? I, not exactly. I pretty much chose as many sites as I could based on what they had available. Right. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Rose? So, <clears throat> kind of piggybacking on that question. Um, you found basically sort of evidence that two species may have sort of were different between the restored and the reference sites, right? Yes. Basically, two species. So, what would you what would be the biological factors that would cause that in your mind? What do you think the the reason for that difference is? I know that both of those species are ones that are just kind of naturally common. So they're both species that are kind of abundant and found in a lot of different areas, and. C. cumatillus is kind of a species that can eat a lot of different um, kinds of food. So since it was, um, it is, it can eat insects and can eat plants. It just kind of possibly um, kind of flourished in an area that had a lot of percent plant cover. And the other species is pretty similar in that thing too. So you think it's primarily a function of plant cover then? I do. I think um, <clears throat> we have found some literature that showed that percent plant cover um, influences the, the, um, the prey that those beetles like to eat. And so since those populations are going up, the beetles have more food that's available. And other, the other species like um, Scaphinotus ventricosis is kind of a cryptic species anyway, since it's not really that, it isn't that mobile since it does live under logs and likes to stay in moist areas. So it's not really one that I think I would have found too often anyways, even though I did find a lot at one particular site. But it could be possible that since that species isn't um, quite as mobile, I just didn't really find any real differences because of that. Okay, so one, one other quick question on this about uh, the moisture. So <clears throat> what were the conditions like in your, I have to follow up from this too, but what were the conditions like in your, um, in your study over the period of time when you showed that decline? The beginning of the season, do you, do you mean based on moisture? Or just, just based on, you, you showed it, you know, clearly there's a decline as they right. get into their end of their season, but my question was, could any of that have been attributed to changes in, in other parameters such as moisture availability? 
I, it's possible. I, since that summer was, I know it's, um, it was pretty temperate throughout the season. So it, the conditions did get drier towards the end of the summer, but they were pretty much um, just about the same. The biggest thing um, I noticed was temperature changes, and I think that um, at least explained the short-term variation. But overall, I think that the decline was just attributed to um, the beetles just... Well, they die out. Yeah, they're dying out and just kind of... Um, it was toward the end of the season, so they were just... Either I was catching them all, or they were just all um, ending their season. The reason why I was asking is I was wondering if there were proportional shifts from the beginning to the end in the, the composition of the species. So as you move from the first part of the season and you through the ending part of the season, is there some sort of difference there? Oh, and, yeah. And the reason why I thought about that, that might have camouflaged some of the differences if you, you know, didn't detect between the two sites. And, um, and it may have been a temperature function or a moisture function, I wasn't sure which, of uh, those things. So you could you know, see what I'm saying? Yes. It might have shifted that. This, this, we've talked about some of this before, and I think that we're going to continue to, to push it. But it, it's interesting, she and I were talking this week about plotting every species out by all of the dates, um, which is a heck of a lot of work, and um, it, it will be done, I suspect, suspect, before it's turned in. Um, but that would help answer some of those questions about the details, you know, the devils and the details. If you can't do statistics, sometimes it's having a nice picture, tell me not. And you so, can even do a quickie on the on the beginning and the end, yeah. just to see whether or not there's a proportional shift. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think that would be an interesting thing to follow up with. And it gets at that question that we we're asking. Okay, so if anything, there are more beetles that are restored, right? So that's weird. That's not right. That's not more like the reference. No, that's mm -hmm. like whoa, better than the reference, or is it? Are these guys um, gluttons for? disturbed area or are they indicators of a restored area? And so I find that very provocative and I think that in, in sort of finalizing your conceptualization of the, of the conversation, I think it's going to be really interesting to, to start to say, well, maybe what these guys are indicating is they're, they're overshooting and they're going to come back down to where the reference should be, if that really where it is. Or maybe the restored site actually is just better. Better. What does better mean? It's going to be supporting greater biodiversity and more so I think that in terms of the interpretation of what you found, there's lots of great studies for the future. <laughs> there's something that you said early on that relates directly to this, and I was wondering if, if this might help to address this question. You said you're doing a letter review that managed areas were better than unmanaged areas for supporting these species, and that, that struck me at times. Like, what does that mean? And if you think about the restored versus the unrestored, the restored is more of a managed area. Um, so is there something about uh, people getting in there and, and moving things around that's actually increasing the abundance and diversity of these beetles, or is that just a... Yeah. I mean, it really, it, it gets into philosophy so quickly that the good news is you don't have to answer it definitively. Do you have any thoughts on it? What's, what's a good habitat? What's a good ecosystem? I kind of think that a greater abundance just means that there, um, there's more available for um, more research, resources available for to you know cater to more, but I also noticed that the total abundance at one site was really high, and then the other sites it was kind of low. So I think total abundance overall is not necessarily that good, but um, since I did comparisons between at each site, that the it just seemed that more at one site could be greater are good. Um, could, the, could the difference in abundance be not due to resources for the adult stage, but survival, overwintering survival of the larvae? I mean, maybe there are some, I don't know, soil conditions that are, I, I mean, I'm not a beetle biologist, but it could be, you know, we're looking at just one stage right. of a very complicated life cycle. So maybe maybe they just don't survive as much in the overwinter. We're master species. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So we have time for one more, maybe two more questions, and then we'll let you under it. I just have one question. <coughs> Um, was there any particular plant species that these beetles had affinity towards? I mean, I don't know if I missed that in the presentation. And if so, is there a correlation between the abundance of that plant species and the beetles? I don't think that they are, um, that they prefer any one species over like any others. They're just kind of, they eat a lot of different things. They're just part of the order that eats all kinds of different stuff. Um, your three side, your three reference sites were like near the restored sites. Um, since they were there, were there any um, any like was there were they like undisturbed sites or was there any like like any of the three sites that had like humans moving through these areas? For they are all areas that aren't really uh, there wouldn't wouldn't necessarily be that much foot traffic along them, but at least the site at Brands of Forty Creek was kind of the area that was directly next to you know people's homes. 